Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Mueller, and I'm the Membership and Events Coordinator with the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. And we are excited that you are joining us today for the second installment of Raising the Bar with Don Hicks, our amazing partner with Shakely. Uh, Don will be bringing these uh, webinars to you monthly. Uh, they will be virtual for right now, but we are hoping at some point to be able to take them back to you in person. Uh, we are recording this, and we will send you a recording of this after today's event. Uh, please feel free to share the information with anybody that you might find uh, beneficial, might find it beneficial. And we will also house these on uh, the Chamber's website as well. If you do have topics of interest uh, to you that might be interesting for future Raising the Bars, please let us know. Don is always looking for ideas and we are always looking for ideas to share with Don. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Don Hicks with Shakely. Very good, Stephanie and Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you for the second edition of Raising the Bar. Every month we're going, going to have these and I, I'm always looking for exciting topics, things that you guys want to learn about or talk about or have an open discussion about. So um, I really appreciate that. Stephanie, can you still see my screen? Is that, is that okay? Yes, I can okay. still your screen. And then I also meant to mention, if anybody has questions, feel free to type those into the chat box and then we will relay them to Don uh, th throughout the presentation or you could type them in and we can do them at the end either. Very good. So also, if anyone on, the, um, on this seminar and if you're not a member of the Medina Chamber, please um, call Stephanie and Jacqueline and Stephanie and so forth and talk about the benefits. There's some amazing, I'm an ambassador with the Medina, Medina Chamber, so I'm a little prejudiced, I would tell you, but they have some amazing benefits for the business community. So if you're not a member, um, I would call Stephanie after this presentation. So today we're going to talk about, uh, does my company need an employee handbook? And we're going to answer that question. So again, thank you for joining me. Really excited to talk about this topic. It's a topic that on the surface may seem a little boring, but is so vitally important. And I come across so many businesses that have so many questions around this topic. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to, um, to listen to what I have to say on this topic. But I want it inter interactive as well. So feel free to offer your thoughts. Whether you agree, agree, agree with me or disagree with me, feel free to uh, provide your thoughts in the commentary. I will ask a few questions along the way. So I will invite you to participate in this, um, in this uh, presentation. So I always like to start with the story. So if you attended the one back in February, I told a story and I will continue to tell stories. I love telling stories, by the way. So, um, and this story has to do with employee handbooks. So there is a large company, I, I won't say the name, but if I did say the name, you would know exactly who I'm talking about. I have thousands of employees. Uh, true story. Um, an employee and their manager um, was obviously working together. And the employee and the manager really did not get along. They have been working together for a number of years. My screen keep blacking out. So if I pause a little bit, I apologize. So they couldn't really get, um, get along. So a number of years went by and one day something happened between the employee and the manager and it was catastrophic. They had an argument and the employee told the manager swore at the manager and used a word that is one of the worst words when, when talking swearing starts with an F, um, say that to the manager and the employee started to walk away. Well, the manager, as you can imagine, fired the employee right on the spot. The employee got his personal belongings and was escorted out by security and uh, was terminated. A few months later, the this particular company I uh, got a lawsuit, a certified letter came in the mail, a lawsuit, and that employee was suing the employer, could not figure out why that employee thought it was right to sue them for wrongful termination. The first thing that the law firm asked for was the employee handbook. A few months go by after that, and it ends up going, it went through the legal process, ends up going through um, the legal proceedings, um, and it was determined that the employee was entitled to get his job back 
he was entitled to back pay and he was entitled to punitive damages for swearing at his manager. Here's the reason why. In the handbook, they had seven conditions that would cause a termination. And guess what one, <laughs> what one was not one of those seven? Swearing at the manager. So we're going to, that's a true story. So uh, because it was in the handbook so specific, uh, it really didn't do the employer any good. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this presentation. Should I have a handbook or should I have a very strict handbook and then everything in between? So let's get started. What are we going to talk about today? We, we are going to answer this question. Uh, do you even need an employee handbook? If I'm a small organization, do I need one? Should I have one? We're going to talk about the reasons why uh, the answer to that question we're going to talk about some of the common mistakes that I see with regards to employee handbooks and having one or not having one. Um, best practices. We're going to play a nice little fun game, true or false, and then obviously answer your questions as we go along. And again, as I go through my presentation, I love answering questions. So feel free to put it in the chat. Okay, let's start with answering this question. And put your answer, just a couple of seconds, put your answer in the chat box. Stephanie, if you can tell me what the answers are, I can't see the chat. Does your company need an employee handbook? And Stephanie, if you can tell me the results. Does your company need an employee handbook? Yes or no, or maybe. Any responses yet, Stephanie? All right. So, so far we have one, two, three yeses and one maybe with question marks. Okay. Three yeses and one maybe with question mark. Okay. Very good. And the answer is, in my opinion, yes. An employee handbook provides written communication of job-related information and expectations for both, for both the employee and the employer. We're going to dive deeper into why that is a yes doing this presentation. However, however, there is no state law that says that you have to have an employee handbook. That's not required. But there are some reasons why you will want to have an employee handbook, regardless of the size of your organization. So let's start there. What, what are some of those reasons why an employee handbook is advisable to have for your organization? First of all, um, it does improve company communications is an opportunity on a mass scale, whether you have two employees or whether you have 20 or 200, you can communicate the company expectations and the culture um, and policies on a big grand scale. And the employee handbook allows the opportunity to do that. The other thing is it saves you a lot of time. If you are managing employees, if you are owner of a company, if you're an office manager, it avoids you having to answer the same question over and over. You can port, point to the handbook and the employee can read it and um, take it home, talk it over with their spouses or their significant other, their partner, whoever. And so it saves a ton of time in regards to answering the same question um, over and over for, for each employees. It also makes sure that you treat everyone equally versus ad hoc. And you can point to your written policies. So if you're treating, if you have the intention, and you should, to treat everyone equally, you can make sure you're following the advice and counsel and the policies and procedures. And you can point, point to the handbook in order to determine how to handle certain situations based on company policy. Versus, I'm going to do the one uh, do something for Don one way and for John another way. So you want to make sure you're treating everyone everyone equally, and the handbook allows you to, to do that. Another one is it reduces workplace conflicts. It reduces workplace conflicts. When, they, when there are written policies in place and the employees know what's, what the expectations are, what the requirements are, what they can and cannot do, it avoids some of those conflicts that can pop up in the in the workplace if you don't have one a handbook or if it's outdated or there's no training around the employee handbook it can cause confusion and, and it can cause conflicts and we have found that having a handbook in place 
is something that is definitely something you want to do. Now, not having one, remember my story that I told, not having one will come up 100% guaranteed if you're ever sued for an employee-related matter. So owners out there, managers out there, supervisors out there, human resources professionals out there, um, I will guarantee you, if you are ever sued by an existing employee, current employee, or former employee, the first thing they're going to ask for, and by the way, if you're sued, it will be subpoenaed. So it's not an, you don't have an option in a lot of cases, whether you're going to produce your handbook or not, if it's that serious of a lawsuit. So it's good to have one if it's going to, if they're going to ask you for it. Um, but it will come up. Lawyers and employment lawyers that is involved with this, go to trial for these cases, they are trained to, um, the, that, that is the first thing they're going to ask for. And if you don't have one, it can, uh, it's a frenzy for them. So, okay. Um, it shows having a handbook shows proactively that you value the workplace culture. You know, what's important to you as a business owner or as a leader of the organization, and you'll be able to just proactively show what you expect from your organization, what you expect from your employees, and it sets the tone proactively through the employee handbook and what's contained in that employee handbook. It also gives you a chance to highlight diversity, equality, inclusion, DEI. Um, that was a topic we talked about back in February. Um, and the handbook is a perfect place to sort of highlight some of those expectations and making sure that you are um, adhering to some of those policies that could be important to the organization and should be important to the organization. Some other reasons why an employee handbook is important is obviously um, pretty self-explanatory on this one, but it does protect the legal rights of both the employee and the employer when something is written and acknowledged and signed off on. It provides evidence to support um, an employer's actions. So again, if you are an owner of a company out there, um, director, executive, um, and you take action for those on your team and you make decisions for those on your team, you want to make sure that that is supported by written policies before you take those actions. Okay. Um, some examples is at will employment versus a contract. Okay, you want to make sure that that is disclosed and acknowledged in your employee handbook. Ohio is a is an at will employment state, so you want to make sure that that is understood and communicated and acknowledged by the employee. Um, having things in place such as anti harassment, sexual harassment, non discrimination policies and expectations um, before you take action, your hiring practices and so forth. Again, that diversity and um, equality can be contained in the handbook before you take certain actions. This is a big one. Um, the next one is wage and hour compliance. I see this. This is one of the biggest items in an employee handbook that causes owners and businesses the most trouble, um, such as when an employee is required to take a break or a lunch or how long the lunch should be or what are the repercussions if they're late? Um, any sales folks that's out there, or if you have sales folks on your teams, how do you pay commissions? What are the expectations around that? And then overtime. I'll tell you another real quick story. I told you I like stories. True story. This happened to me. I had a client back in 2006 um, that owned a really, really growing business. He had about 14, 15 employees at the time. This is 2006. Um, he had one employee, had no handbook in place, zero. So he called me in there and he had a problem. The problem he had was he had an employee that was racking up overtime. Like you wouldn't believe he had no family, um, no children, and he loved to work. And he came in, he was working, I don't know, 70 hours a week or something, something ridiculous, 70, 75 hours a week just coming in on the weekends and holidays and racking up overtime. Well, it was costing the employer money and there was no reason for them for that employee to work overtime, but he would come in, he would clock in and they would pay him. But it got to a point that they had to put a stop to it. Um, 
The problem, though, he went to the employee and said, listen, whatever the name was, it doesn't matter what the name is. He said, you know, before you work overtime, I need for you to come to me and I have to approve it. And the employee shook his head and said, OK, show me where that is in the employee handbook. And the owner was like, uh, you got me. I don't have one. And he didn't. And the employee had had he still had to continue paying overtime. So he was able to negotiate with the employee. We were able to help him with that eventually. But because he didn't have that uh, that specific overtime policy in the handbook, it, it literally cost him thousands of dollars. So that's an area that you should have and should address and communicate um, when it comes to an employee handbook. Also, any type of drug testing expectations or background checks for your employees should be in the, in the employee handbook. Um, don't pop that up on your employees and you know, you're know you not requiring it and then you do require it or there's no notice or you may do it for one employee and not the other. So those policies that are spelled out and communicated to your organization of what those expectations are should be in your employee handbook. And if it's not, or if it's done ad hoc, um, it can it can cause some problems. So that's some examples of um, using the employee handbook to provide evidence to, to support what you want to do um, for the organization. Also, employee rights. An employee handbook can lay out a plan to handle issues internally versus externally. So I have seen cases where because there was no known procedure to arbitrate an issue or a conflict or a complaint, the employee simply didn't know that he needed to go to someone, his manager, or, you know, if they are having an issue with this, here are the procedures to get that resolved. Here's what that looks like. Here's who you need to go to. So those employees that don't know that, um, sometimes they would just automatically, they have an issue and they'll contact an attorney or they'll make an anom anonymous call to OSHA or uh, an anonymous call to EEOC, whatever the case may be. But if that is communicated that, hey, if you have an issue, here are the procedures, um, that really lays out a plan because I tell you, if an issue an employee has uh, on your company goes outside the organization to someone else, another agency, an attorney, it can literally cost you thousands of dollars and cr create all kinds of problems versus a procedure that, that um, is known that can be handled internally. Okay, makes sense? Awesome. Also, um, reasons why to have an employee handbook is it provides managers and supervisors with resources. This is a pet peeve of mine personally. I see so many organizations that have managers and supervisors, and managers and supervisors are awesome at their technical skill. Obviously, that's why they are a manager or supervisor, but they have no training and no resources on managing employees from a human resources, personality, complexities, complexities, what to do, what not to do, how to handle certain situations, they're bad. In most organizations, they're bad. They're not trained for that. They're trained, managers and, and supervisors are mostly trained on their technical skill. But when it comes to policies, procedures, handbooks, personal issues, personal matters for the organization, um, it's, it's a challenge but a handbook can provide resources for them to use as part of your policies and procedures. Injury reporting procedures. So a handbook is highly appropriate to have um, in your handbook, what do you do if an employee gets injured, right? Um, what are those procedures? What does that look like? You know, if someone, gets, if someone in the workplace gets seriously injured, do coworkers know what to do? Or will they freeze? Will they just freeze because something catastrophic has happened? So it's really good to have injury reporting procedures in place. So if anyone does get injured, um, they can get the right medical attention. It's a smooth flowing process where everybody can uh, know their roles and know how to handle those particular situations. Also, 
an employee handbook. This is these are areas that are overlooked sometimes. Um, it's highly appropriate to put into a handbook. What are your emergency procedures and how do your employees need to handle those? Active shooters, if there's a fire, weather, natural disasters, um, terrorist attacks, you name it. You know, it's good to have that in an employee handbook because your employees will ask you questions about that. So if that's important to you and it should be, it's highly appropriate to have that in the employee handbook and, com and continually um, communicate on that. And lastly, the employee handbook provides industry specific information on you know, various federal and state laws. Pretty self-explanatory. There are some laws out there that applies to all size businesses, whether you are a one employee company or a thousand. So you wanna make sure that you have those incorporated into your handbook. And lastly, I'm sorry, lastly, a handbook is there to brag, right? A handbook doesn't necessarily have to be um, policies and procedures. It doesn't necessarily have to be, here's what you're going to do. If you don't do it, you get into trouble or things that you can't do. It can be a chance to highlight the good things that the company does, your benefits, your time off policies, your commitment to family, your commitment to time off, um, the company picnic, bonuses, end of, end of the year commissions, anything that you think set your, sets you apart from your competitors by working there, an employee handbook is a perfect opportunity for you to highlight that and brag about the um, uniqueness of your organization. And company size, and I've mentioned that a couple of times now, company size does not matter when it comes to an employee handbook. Remember, it's not necessarily required by any type of law, but it is highly appropriate. Some of the things that we're talking about, um, it is highly appropriate and advisable to have one, whether you are a small company, medium-sized company, or a large company. Okay? Make sense? All right. What are some of the common mistakes that I have seen? Um, and based on some of the research that I've done, when talking about an employee handbook, those mistakes that you want to erase and avoid. So take a look at your, your handbook when we finish this call to see if any of these apply, apply to you. The biggest and first one is not updating your handbook enough. Not, I'm, I, I've never kept statistics on this, but I'm going to guess, and I've been doing this a while, I'm going to guess less than 10% of, of businesses update their handbooks annually. That's a complete guess on my part. Um, you have to update your handbooks annually. So look at your handbook right now, if you have it in front of you, or when you get off this call and see when it was last updated. Your handbook right now should be updated for 2020. And if it's not, you are at risk. I'm telling you, um, you are at risk. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. What happened in 2020? Not much, right? No, COVID. Your employee handbook needs to have pandemic illness policies in them. Um, it should incorporate some of the, some of the challenges um, for COVID and vaccinations and so forth. So if your handbook hasn't been updated since 2020, it's outdated already. Another mistake is not having one in the first place, Okay not having one in the first place. We, we answered that question at the very beginning. Also a common mistake when it comes to handbooks is relying on the internet. Do not download a uh, handbook template from Google or the internet or any other site without it being legally vetted. Do not do it. It is almost better not to have one than, than to have one that is not properly put together is not properly vetted and legally reviewed by an attorney or expert, someone that is trained in these issues. So do not download. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my computer here. Hold on, sorry. There we go. Do not um, download your handbook from, from the internet. The third one is something that you may not realize is having unrealistic policies in your handbook. And the biggest one that I see is 
the um I'm sorry, I'm having all these problems with my computer. Um, handbook, a policy in there is do not discuss compensation. That is a unrealistic, unrealistic policy. I have to tell you, I have to break it to you. Just because you have it in the handbook, employees will talk about compensation at the water cooler. And there are, the jury is a little bit still out on this. There are some, there are some questions whether having that policy don't discuss compens your compensation with another employee. There is some challenges with that with um, does it violate labor laws from a federal state standpoint? Not quite sure on that yet, but it is unrealistic. And I personally don't think that that will hold up any type of legal review, a stringent legal review of you having um, that goal. I'm sorry, that policy of don't talk about your compensation with another. Um, I don't think that really solves anything. And there's other ways to, to handle that. But that is a that is a huge mistake that a lot of companies make. I just know that, you know, if it was me personally, and you don't want me to talk about my compensation with anyone else, but you have to put that in a handbook, it will lead me to believe personally that you're treating someone differently for whatever arbitrary reasons. I don't know. It just doesn't sit right with me. So be careful with that if your employee handbook has that. And there's other ways to handle that if that's important to you. Another mistake is your handbook is way too confusing. It is filled with legal terms, is confusing, is inconsistent. You know, I have seen that. I have seen a policy on page two and then on page 14, it's completely different than the policy that's on page two. Um, I have seen handbooks that are done by uh, uh, an attorney that has all these fancy legal terms that no one can understand. No one can understand. So you want to make sure it's legally reviewed, but really have a good balance that is understandable and can be understood by an average person. Okay. Now, too many specifics will also box you in. Remember my story when I first started. Remember that employee that got terminated, seven reasons in the handbook that causes termination and swearing was not one of them. They were boxed in. It was too specific. And by the way, that handbook, I think, was about 120 some pages long. 120. Some. This, this company probably has a legal staff of 60 attorneys. And it was just too specific and it got them in trouble. So too many, too many specifics in your, in your handbook can cause some problems too. And if you have an employee population that are bilingual, have multiple languages, um, make sure your employee handbook is provided and available in that language. I know that's something that Shakely does. So we have the ability to um, have our policy, help our clients have our policies in, in Spanish and other, other um, languages and so forth. So if you have a bilingual audience that are employed by your company, make sure you also provide, um, provide it in that language as well. The other common mistake is that the employee handbook is not signed off by all employees, including your current employees, okay? Um, I have seen organizations where they spend the money, they take the time, to develop and update their employee handbook, and they only distribute it to new employees from that point forward. No. Um, yes, you should do that, but make sure that you are also um, communicating it and making it available to your current employees as well. So all employees need to be um, involved in acknowledging your employee handbook, whether they are current employees or, or, or new employee. And then um, the last mistake that I've seen is not providing any training on what's in the handbook. I see a lot of organizations, they just make it available. Hey, here, welcome aboard, and here's a copy of your handbook, and that's it. And they'll say, um, read it on your own time. If you have any questions, let me know. I think that's a mistake. You should take time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and over lunch, during the new hire orientation process, discuss it, answer their questions, communicate it, give the employee time to take it home, talk it over with their spouses, significant other partners, 
and provide them to bring it back and then ask additional questions and make sure that it's communicated at least twice a year. Update your employee handbook annually and provide an opportunity for employees to ask questions twice a year is my recommendation. So don't just hand it to them. Um, do some training, bring in pizzas, make it fun, make some contests, whatever the case may be um, um, for your employees. So again, sorry if you're seeing this on my screen, but my computer is not acting right. So, okay, let's talk about some best practices. First one is, we talked a little bit about this, hire an expert to assist and counsel you. Do not do this on your own. Remember, don't download anything from Google or anything like that. And if you don't have the experience in this, if you're not comfortable in crafting a handbook, maybe you're not, you, don't, you don't have the background, the HR or legal background, hire someone to do that, to do this for you. It's worth, it's not very relative to the product that you're going to get. That's vetted, that's legal, that's updated hire a professional to do it. You know, Shakely, this is something that we do. There's, there are other um, um, vendor partners with the Medina Chamber that provide similar services, you know, so whether it's Shakely or someone else, uh, and you're not comfortable with this, make sure you get someone to help you with this. Again, number two, uh, make sure that your current policy, I'm sorry, your current handbook now includes pandemic policies pandemic policies. That's very, very important on a going forward basis to handle what's going on now, but prospectively to incorporate um, some of these diseases and pandemic policies and how to handle those. The third one, hugely, enormously important. Make sure your policy, your handbook addresses social media policies, social media policies. Um, your company reputation is at risk here. Your employees can do something silly, something as seemingly um, simple as liking something that's controversial. And if someone knows you work for XYZ company and blast that out, your company reputation is at risk. Okay, Facebook, LinkedIn, controversial post commenting on controversial topics and they know that you are representative of your, of your company, maybe it is important to you, maybe it's not, but I would highly recommend that you figure out what's important to you in regards to social media and that your employees are following and understand what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do and the expectations around that. So I have seen it. You know, last summer, I had a couple of clients dealing with that. Controversial post, um, employee didn't know that the employee was doing it, and it caused all kinds of havoc, um, and it had to be dealt with, okay? Another one is, as a best practice, make it part of your onboarding process, obviously, your employees acknowledging and signing off on, on your employee handbook. Um, if you're doing your onboarding manually, which you shouldn't be, you should be automating your onboarding, but if you're doing your uh, onboarding manually, uh, make sure you get that sign-off sheet. It's a one-page sheet, paragraph, I, Don Hicks, have received a copy and understand my employee handbook. And make sure it's signed off on and your updates, and your updates. So get those acknowledgements from your current employees and make sure you get those acknowledgements and sign off on um, your new hires as well. Also, customize your handbook to fit your culture and your business goals. You can structure your handbook that is completely aligned with the revenue goals of the, of the organization, the culture you're trying to build, the culture that you're trying to keep um, can all be done and communicated and written down in one document through the employee handbook. That is a perfect place. Having it just on your website, in my view, isn't enough isn't enough. It needs to be in, in uh, an employee handbook. Again, update your handbook at least once a year, at least once a year, and make sure that when you do an employee handbook, that you account for your strategy, your long-term strategic business plans. 
for example, any growth plans that you have, if you're looking to uh, open up a new location in another state, if you have employees that work in um, the border states, you know, Youngstown, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, Toledo, Michigan, or whatever else the case may be, if you are in the long haul trucking business and you have employees that travel to multiple states, make sure your employees, I'm sorry, make sure your employee handbook accounts for those uh, strategies and growth plans and so forth. And make sure your employee handbook handles or addresses what kind of hiring plans. So if you are at, you know, seven employees today, but you anticipate to hire 10 this year or next year, you want to make sure your employee handbook handles that and anticipates that growth and not just your current base. So, okay, hopefully that helps. So let's play a quick game. Um, Stephanie, any questions at this point? Uh, none that have popped up. So if anyone has questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, Don your question uh, yourself, you are welcome to do that as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. True or false. All righty. If you can put your answer, true or false in the chat box, it will be great. All right. You ready? First question. My company is too small to need a handbook, true or false? Mm, we have a couple, three falses, four falses. False, very good. We talked about it. It doesn't matter about the size of your organization. If you have one employee, one plus employees at your organization, an employee handbook is absolutely um, advisable to have. Okay. Not required, right. By law, remember, but definitely worthwhile having. Let's try another one. We don't need a handbook because all of our employees love working here. Why do I need a Don? Why do I need a handbook? Everyone here is family, right? They love me. They love working here. We've been around for 30 years and never had a problem. True or false? Four falses and one person said false, but I wish it was true. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that answer. Yes, that's a fallacy. I hear that all the time, though. So you guys on this call are very smart, <laughs> very smart. But I hear this. I hear this all the time. Um, I'm a family owned business. I love not having a handbook because we just love one another. I hear it at least once a week, uh, not from the, the people on this call, thankfully, but yeah, that in my view, that's a fallacy. Uh, do not fall into that trap. And I have seen so many organizations, I'm dealing with a case right now where this was sort of the, the issue. And now he has a um, $500,000 lawsuit that he's dealing with, a local company. I'm not gonna say the name, obviously. No need to say the name, but these things, the, the, these, these issues are not meant to scare you. I, and I'll please don't take it that way. Um, but I have seen these are true stories that I'm telling and I deal with it all the time. So please don't fall into the trap that all of your employees love you. They would never sue you. I can tell you 100% certainty that is not true. All of your employees do not love you. Okay. I don't care if they even tell you that. Um, I go to too many, well, when we could, barbecues and picnics and getting to know people and, you know, you just meeting someone and the first, one of the first questions you ask is, so what do you do for a living? And then once you get to know that person, it's like, oh my God, I hate my boss. So I wish I worked somewhere else. They won't tell you that though, but they'll tell others. So just be careful of that. That's all I'm saying. All right. Last one. Last question. Get ready. We should ensure that the handbook is signed off on by all employees. True or false? Uh, we have four trues. Any falses? No, no falses. All right, good. <laughs> good. 
That's right. I've said that enough. So very good. Very good. So yes, having a handbook is not effective if it's not acknowledged. It, is, it does no good to take the time, effort, expense um, to, uh, to have a handbook and it's not sign off on. Okay. That's just doing half the job. So awesome. Very good. I, I, I think that's the end of my, yes, that's the end of my presentation. That is my contact information there. So feel free to reach out to me about this topic or any other topic. Be more than happy to talk with you. No cost, no time limit. Um, I'm passionate about these things that we talk about and that we discuss and that we teach. So feel free to reach out to me. I will have a private conversation with you. And by the way, um, anyone, you know, anyone that talks to me offline, um, all conversations are, are confidential and private. So um, Stephanie, Jacqueline, the Medina Chamber, we could not be more proud to be partnering with you. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Don't leave yet though, because we may have some questions. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this issue. Um, see me next month. We, be, we will be doing another topic um, the third Thursday of April, same time, 10 o'clock Eastern. So with that, Jacqueline, I'm sorry, Stephanie, any questions? I don't see any that have been popped up into the chat box. If you do have a question, feel free, as I've mentioned, to type it into the chat box. We can relay it to Don or uh, feel free to unmute yourself. If you're having difficulty unmuting yourself, uh, let us know in the chat box. Uh, we do have a couple people calling in via phone. I believe it's star six to unmute yourself. Hopefully this was helpful for everyone just to get you thinking. Um, so hopefully you took, took away some things that you can use um, right away for your organization, so. Awesome. No questions? No, I'm not seeing any. Oh, wait, yes, there is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, do you recommend that as the CARES Act leaves are changing that we do stipulate that may change? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, on the CARES Act, it's, it's such in flux right now with everything going on. There's so much in change, uh, so much changing with it. PPP loans, COVID pay policies, COVID pay. Um, exp By the way, if you don't know, there is a COVID, COVID pay um, requirement and there's tax credits you can get by providing COVID pay. If you want more information, call me. Um, so that's a very good question. You know, before I put a lot of time and effort in changing my, my handbook uh, for the CARES Act, I will probably give it another 60 days or so to see how things are gonna shake out, how things are gonna play out, how the vaccines are going to um, play out, if there's going to be any other stimulus, needed or done, I probably will give it another 60 days or so before really spending a lot of time um, changing your handbook because of the cares. Because what you don't want to do is, you know, change something now. And then three months from now, because of the COVID and changes or whatever, um, it has to be changed, changed again, and you have to incur another expense. So I would, I would update it based on what's now, but the CARES Act, I will probably leave that act if leave that out for now until at least another 60 days or so. So hopefully that answers your question. But um, I would, um, I would on that related to that, I would now, I would make sure that you have pandemic policies in place. I will make sure you look at your training on um, pandemic illnesses, communicable diseases, uh, uh, bloodborne pathogen policies, and that is just um, diseases you can get or sickness you can get from the air, particularly if you work in a manufacturing or a closed in space. Uh, I, would, I would address some of those policies now, but just the CARES Act, I probably would hold off on that.
So. And Claire, who asked that question, just wrote back, thank you. We have just been doing meetings to update people as changes occur, yeah. but we do have them sign a roster so we can acknowledge that we did so. Oh, Claire, love it. Absolutely perfect. Love it. That And, and for the group, that's a really good practice. And I didn't even mention that. Um, when you do training, the thing I love about that is you're communicating as a group and you're you know, it sounds like you're providing an opportunity for people to ask questions and so forth. And your evidence, right? We talked about evidence to, to support your actions, that roster. So you can point to and say, listen, I proactively met with my employees, communicated something, and they sign off on it. That is wonderful. So very good job, Claire. Awesome. Love it. Any other last minute questions? Uh, again, feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna ask your question and it is star six. If you are calling in via Zoom, that will unmute your line uh, since I know you don't have the option to do chat with us. Claire said that it was a good presentation and she looks forward okay. to future ones. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank and you. And Claire, if there certainly are any topics that yeah. um, are of interest to you, please let us know. Um, Don's always open to suggestions and we anticipate that certainly as things change or um, go back to maybe a, a new normal, that there will be things that will come up that Don will be happy to tackle yeah. for these presentations as well. Yeah, we tried to make the, the, the topics relevant to what's going on at the time and to make it fun. That's the goal. It probably isn't fun. I'm probably failing at that, but at least we try. So thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to, to chat with us and attend this. Wish you all well. And again, please do not, do not hesitate to uh, contact me. And if you're not a member of the chamber, call Stephanie. So really good stuff. So, all righty. Thanks everyone. Thank you, chamber. Appreciate it.